Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. It is time for our monthly edition of What's New at Ancestry. This is for December 2017. Let's go ahead and dive right in with plans for 2018 genealogy events. Um, this calendar uh, hasn't changed since last month. I've shared it with you before, but if you haven't joined us for a What's New episode before, I just wanna make sure you have an opportunity to see what is coming up in major genealogical events for the year of 2018. The big one, of course, is the Roots Tech Conference coming up in Salt Lake City. It is coming up very quickly, and I believe they have extended their early bird registration deadline. So if you want to head over to their website, rootstech.org, you can check out all the details for that, including the deeply discounted early registration price that ends very soon. Uh, hotels for that event are also selling out very quickly. So if you haven't yet made the reservations, you might want to look at doing that. Now, of course, the National Genealogical Society Conference is in Grand Rapids, Michigan this year in May. Again, hotels for that are selling out very quickly. Those are just the hotels at the conference rate. So if you want to get a conference rate for the hotel, if you are coming in from out of town for any of these events, the earlier you book, the better. The Southern California Genealogy Jamboree in Burbank every year uh, is going to be a weekend earlier this, this coming year. So if you've come before, keep that in mind as you are planning out your budget and your vacation time for next year. Uh, the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies annual conference is going to be held in Warsaw, Poland this year. So if you have Eastern European ancestry, that might be something worth looking into. And then the Federation of Genealogical Societies is holding their annual conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana uh, in August. And of course, I'm very excited about that because in Fort Wayne, Indiana is the Allen County Public Library, which is the second largest genealogical library in the world. And anytime I can get my hands on original documents or do some research in offline records that have not yet been digitized, I am thrilled to do so. So I'm looking forward to that. I will be at every one of these events this coming year. So if you are planning on attending, please make note of that. I would love to meet you. Now, at the bottom of your screen there, you're going to see a URL for conferencekeeper.org. Um, that is a site where lots of state and local and regional genealogical societies and groups have put uh, their calendar or their events on that schedule. So if you can't make it to one of the national events, check out that schedule. Be sure to look at what's going on locally in your area. If you're just dipping your toes into the genealogy pool, those are a great place to start. Now, let's move on. I don't have any changes made to the website today, and that's um, the same reason why there's only 12 million new records that have been added in the last month. Typically, November and December are some of the highest trafficked months on the Ancestry websites. So lots of people coming and doing family history, which makes sense because it's, you know, it's, we're headed into winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we've got lots of holidays where people are spending time with family. So we just see a real big increase in traffic to the websites. What that means is, is that Ancestry tries not to make very many changes to the site during that period of time, just so that um, there's no disruption. And that means, so that means no new changes to announce this month, um, but it also means only about 12 million new records have been added in this past month. Now, these records are fantastic, so um, certainly not um, anything worth sneezing at, but is that the right way to use that phrase? <laughs> so if you've never used, uh, visited us for a What's New episode before, let me just show you quickly how you can keep up with new content throughout the month. Under search, if you scroll down to card catalog and click on that, you're going to get a listing of all of the databases available on Ancestry. Now the default sort for that list is by popularity, but you can change that to sort it by date added. And what it does is it just puts all the new stuff at the top of the list. Let's scroll down here. We're going to jump over here to page two near the bottom. When you hover over any database, if you just hover over it, it's going to show you the date that that was published on Ancestry. So you can see here, I've jumped directly to the things that were published the 1st of November. So in the month since we last had a What's New episode. And you can just look through the new content. This is something you can check every day. You can check it once a week. I check it about every two weeks 
just to see what's new and if there's any new records that will help me in my genealogical research. And then I'll go specifically to that database. So you can open up a specific database and what it will do is it will show you your search box. Each database on Ancestry has its own unique search box customized based on what we know is indexed in that particular collection of records. Below that, you're going to find source information. That's going to tell you where Ancestry obtained these records from. And then you're also going to see a database description. And that database description, sometimes like this one, they're brief with a link elsewhere for more information. Sometimes they're more lengthy. It just depends on what information Ancestry obtained from the original record holder. But these descriptions are designed to help you understand the records a little bit better before you start using them. So I would encourage you to always read that database description wherever possible. And then one of the things that I like to do is I like to just come in and just do a basic search for something just to see what kind of results I get, to see how the records are formatted, to see what type of information might be included. In this case, these are really cool. They're portraits of World War I soldiers from Queensland, Australia. And so you get this portrait and a little snippet of description with information um, about uh, the fact that they served in World War I. So uh, lots of really cool things on the site, but uh, that's how I generally approach new databases. Check out the source information, read the database description, do just a generic search, sometimes with a surname, sometimes with just a year or a location, just to see what pops up so that then when I start searching it for my people, I know what I'm getting, uh, getting into. Now, let me just highlight a few specific databases this month. First up is the Fife Scotland Electoral Registers. These date from 1914 to 1966. So um, in the UK, typically uh, uh, we've got this 100-year um, privacy law on census records, which means the most recently available census out of the UK um, is going to be 1911. So any records after that that we can get our hands on is always much appreciated. Now this happens to be a collection of more than a million records of electoral registers. And electoral registers are particularly important because it helps you track people's movement over time, much like a census or a city directory. And it also helps you understand if somebody shows up on a um, electoral register, it usually means that they either just moved into the area or that they came of age. And if somebody falls off of an electoral register, uh, you know, year, year over year, it usually means that they either moved out of the area or passed away. So electoral registers provide really great clues for family history research. Next up, we have a huge collection of Ontario, Canada, Roman Catholic baptisms, marriages, and burials. These date back to 1760 and they go through 1923. Now, um, one of the things that's important in family history research, and this particular collection has about 3 million records in it, so it's this really, really great collection, but one of the things that you start to understand is important, especially as you go back further in time looking for your ancestors, is knowing what religion they affiliated with. And that's important because very often, that's where the records were kept, is with whatever ecclesiastical organization um, they associated with. So governments didn't keep birth, marriage, and death records here in the U.S. And in many cases until the early 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. Um, in England, of course, that was 1837, and that's fantastic. But, but you, around the world, it's different. And around the United States, state by state, it's different. So uh, church records are the next step in continuing your research back through time. Churches very often kept records of baptisms, marriages, and burials, and the Catholic Church in particular has been very meticulous about that. So these are really great records. Um, they'll often link entire families or generations together. One of the things that I recommend when you search collections like this is if you know specifically where in Ontario, for example, your family was, um, was baptized or married or buried, uh, particularly if you know the parish, search that parish for just your surname and you'll get a list of everybody in that parish with that surname and what you'll often discover is 
missing children that you didn't know about before. You'll start to find women's maiden names. You'll start to be able to piece families together a lot more quickly than if you're searching for a specific individual every time. Now, of course, there's still a place and a time for that kind of search, but I love to do location and surname searches only in specific databases because I find that it gets me um, a, a lot faster. Now, for those of you who are doing research in Canada, you have a little bit of advantage over some of the rest of us in that the Canadian census uh, very often lists religious affiliation. So pay attention to that on the census and you'll know if you should be looking uh, in, a, in a Roman Catholic um, church or in an Anglican church of some sort, okay? That is the Ontario Catholic baptisms, marriages, and burials. Next up, we have a record collection that I have not been able to spend nearly enough time with since it came out a few weeks ago, and that is the New Jersey State Census Collection. Now, we have census records for 1855, 1865, 1875, 1885, 1905, and 1915. Much like other states in the United States, uh, where the federal government takes the census on the tens, 1900, 1910, 1920, and so on, the states will on occasion take a census on the fives, 55, 65, 75, and so on. And so what we're seeing here is New Jersey and their consistency in doing that. The other thing that you need to uh, be aware of is that each of these censuses, each of these state censuses is in a separate database. So in some instances where Ancestry has obtained state censuses, the um, state archive or library where we obtained those records uh, has us put them all in one database covering a span of years. In this case, you can see here, these census records are each in their own individual database. So best practice is of course to search each database. Now remember the trick about a location and a surname. I find that putting in a lived in location, so for example, if I come in here to 1875, I'm gonna use the lived in field. That's the one that's going to be the, um, the best or the most useful field. So I click here in lived in, and I'm just gonna type in typically a county. And the reason I use a county instead of a town is because Town boundaries shifted a lot. Sometimes a town hadn't been incorporated yet, and so it was just labeled as some kind of a district in the county. Whereas if I, if I put in the county, I know I'm most likely to get the most accurate results or the most um, best chance of finding the people that I'm looking for. So I can put in a specific county. Now, always choose it from the drop-down list wherever possible because then that enables you to use these filters, and I can say this county for example, an adjacent county. So I happen to know that my family was centered in Burlington County, but that there were people who lived in some of those surrounding counties as well that were part of the family. And then remember I said earlier, just throw in a last name and see what comes up for that particular surname in that specific location. Now, I probably should have done that ahead of time so that I knew that they were there, um, but that's the best way to search that. Okay, the other thing that you need to be aware of with these New Jersey state census records, if you look over here, you'll see uh, for 1855, for example, 1 .2, or 1885, we have 1 1.2 million records. For 1915, we have 2.8 million records. But for some of these years, we have significantly fewer records. That 1875 census being one of those, why well, I probably should have paid closer attention to what I was doing there. Um, because not every county has records that survive or that were made available to Ancestry. So in the, 18, in the case of the 1875 census, um, this particular census only has images and records for one county in New Jersey, Sussex County. And so uh, it's important to read that database description or to look at this browse box over there before you dive in and start searching. That way you won't do like what I just did where you're searching in the wrong year for a county that isn't included in that particular set of records. Now, if I come in here to the 1915 census, for example, you'll see over here on the right-hand side, this browse box includes all of these counties. If I scroll down here to the database description, I get information that lets me know that there's not a limitation or a restriction. So I could then just run that same search, uh, Burlington County, New Jersey. I'm gonna select it from the type ahead. 
I'm going to say county and adjacent counties. And now we'll see if my family comes up because we have more counties included and voila, 385 results, much more in line with what I was looking for. So uh, that is one of the ways that I use those records. And like I said, I haven't spent nearly enough time with these New Jersey State Census collections yet, but I fully intend to because apparently I have 385 Lippincotts in that state that I need to go through. Okay, next up is the U.S. Railroad Retirement Pension Index. This dates from 1934 to 1987. Now here in the United States, the railroad was a huge employer for many years and its retirement plan was the beginning of uh, Social Security. And so what we're going to see is this pension index is going to give us information about who worked for the railroad and uh, information about their pension. Remember, it is just an index. The purpose of an index is to lead you to the original records. So be sure to check out that source information so that you know where the original records are held. Sometimes an index is all Ancestry can acquire from the original uh, record holder, but I love indexes because they tell me exactly where to go to get a copy of that original record. And then last up, what you're going to see, and I use the word various, that is not the name of the database. Uh, various just means we have multiple databases uh, that contain German civil registration. Now I've talked about this before, but let me just give you a quick refresher. Civil registration is government registration of births, marriages, and deaths. That is as opposed to ecclesiastical or uh, church organizational uh, records, which, com which contain information about baptisms, marriages, and burials. So civil is government versus church. Now, the German government didn't start keeping records until about 1876, and those records in this particular instance, for some regions, go all the way through 1978, which, again, if you're doing research in Germany, you know is a really big deal to have access to records uh, that um, recent in time. Now, various, uh, I wrote various there because if we come back here to the card catalog, what you're going to notice is that each of these German databases uh, are, are by specific location. So the way that German research is done in particular, so you can see here very specific locations in Germany. Uh, all of the, almost all of the German databases on Ancestry fall into this same pattern. And that just is a further um, piece of evidence, if you will, that in order to do research in Germany, if you know your family's from Germany, it is critical, critical, critical that you know exactly where in Germany they were from because the records are mostly all local level records. So it's not like here in the United States where we have a nationwide census or like England where we have a nationwide birth, marriage, and death registry. In Germany, the records are held at local levels. And so as Ancestry obtains those records and digitizes them, they're put in individual databases. Uh, now, technically you could do a global search. That's what we call when you just click the search button and search all 20 billion records on our website. You could do a global search with a birth location of Germany marked exact and see what comes up in all the various databases. But again, much like any genealogy research, unless you have a location, you run the risk of misidentifying somebody, of pulling someone with the same name who's about the right age and just because they live in Germany doesn't mean that's your person. There could be 17 other men with the same name uh, and you need to be able to sort them out. So as always, the more information you can gain about location as you do your research, the more likely you are to correctly identify the right person in those records and the more useful these German databases are going to be for you because you'll know exactly which location, so which databases to go and mine for additional information about your family. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, if not, maybe I'll throw together a video a little bit uh, later in the year, next year, about location and how to find some of those locations. That is all I have for you today. Uh, hopefully that was useful for you. I am putting together the January, February, March 2018 calendar of topics for our episodes of the Barefoot Genealogist. So if you have suggestions, I would love to hear those. You can email me at ask at ancestry.com. Just put video suggestion or my name or Barefoot Genealogist in the subject line of that email so that I can sort it out with some of the others. 
And uh, I'll put those on a list, putting together that calendar, hoping to get it published soon on the Ancestry Facebook events page so that you can see what the topics are coming up that might be of interest to you. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.